Make sure I'm on the right page. Um, the reading this morning will be from Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the, men, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120, and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with, his, with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong he burst open in the middle, and all of his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem so that field is called in their own language a kel dama. This is a field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they, and they proposed two. Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was outnumbered with the eleven apostles. All right, good morning. All right, uh, thank you. I was given two notes, and I better read them now, or I'll, I might forget them. 
And so uh, the first uh, says that Joy McCorkle will be having an MRI tomorrow on her kidneys and, in, and on other areas. And so uh, let's remember Miss Joy. Miss Joy is Danny's mom. And then also, I believe this is from Danny and Lena. Um, it, in addition to that, it says that we had a dear friend, his name is Robert Fulkerson, die suddenly on Friday. And so p- please remember his wife, Delona, their two sons, and their families in your prayers. And uh, she notes that Robert was like a brother to Danny. And so let's remember the McCorkle family and the Fulkerson family. And uh, they have uh, experienced a lot of loss and heartache over the past few weeks and months. And then this is uh, really exciting. Um, I knew some of this was going on, but, uh, but I'm, I'm glad to be able to make this announcement. And so uh, we have some women uh, here who have expressed an interest in further study of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And uh, if, if that's the first time you're hearing that and you'd like to be a part of that, please see Mary-Kate. Where are you, Mary-Kate? Hey, there's Mary-Kate, back there in the back. And so if you don't know Mary-Kate, you should. You, you're missing out on a blessing. And so if you're here this morning uh, as a woman who would like to further study Matthew 5, 6, and 7, see her. Uh, the plan is to start a group message for encouragement, discussion, and even memorization. All right, all right. And so that's exciting. Um, that is really exciting. Let's see. Uh, keep your Bibles open to Acts chapter 1, if you will, please. That's where we'll be this morning. And uh, I am also very excited to continue in this. Uh, I would like to attempt to kind of work through uh, verse 12 through about verse 26. And some of y'all are probably like, yeah, right, Stephen. Um, but, uh, but I've got a new way, maybe. Maybe maybe you'll, you'll pick up on this new way um, that I might try to work through Acts with you. Uh, your, your presence is encouraging, and I mean that. Um, uh, it, there, there's, the writer was correct to say that the gatherings of Christians should not be forsaken for the purpose of encouragement. That's Hebrews 10. And, and so that we can encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching. Uh, um, you know, whatever that means, we can talk about that. I think I have an idea. But, but again, the idea of that text is that we gather together to encourage one another as, as we follow Jesus together. And so I can... Um, rightly say from the bottom of my heart that it is an encouragement for you to be here. You've encouraged me already this morning. And all the little things that happen that I want to share with you. Like I know we have a visitor here today who's never been here before, but who years ago was influenced uh, by a spiritual mentor who does attend here with us. And he's here with us this morning. And that's really exciting. Uh, I know we have kids and children who are here uh, who are excited uh, for what they're learning. Uh, I talked to some of you this morning about other just good and various things. I'll be going somewhere this week I'm excited about with one of you, and so this is just good, and it it really is an encouragement. Um, Our congregation is something to be excited about. I'm convinced that this congregation is something to be excited about, and so I plead with you um, to be a part of it and to dig in, and last week I encouraged you to take an adventure with me. Do you remember that? We encouraged each other to jump on board and let's adventure through the book of Acts and so I'm excited uh, to get to do that. Some of you may think you're just using preacher language. I get it. I get it. Like, it's what I do. And so to call a book of the Bible an adventure, yeah, that's good preacher talk, right? I believe it. I believe it. Um, how can studying through Acts be an adventure? Well, I believe that this book details God's desire for us. That also sounded like a preacher, didn't it? This book gives an account, a story, of the people who lived out this faith. And their life became a fulfillment of God's desire for them. Does that mean anything to you? I believe there's a God who's really good. And I believe that He created us and and, and that He wanted to. I believe that you're not a burden to Him. He likes you. (laughs) And He has a plan for your existence. And it's to live out this inspired life that, that, that brings heaven to earth now even. And that our promise is for this abundance of life forever one day. That is our hope. And so, 
If you're, if you're not super excited about that, then a little of me is concerned that maybe your heart is set on things that are less. Does that make sense? I'm not concerned because I think you're a bad person. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. If you're not excited about God's desire. I'm not, I'm not concerned that I think you're, 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 just, you're just evil or mean or whatever. I'm concerned because you may have your heart set on something that is less. You may have your heart set on something that stresses you out, that burdens you, that, that steals or robs God's purpose for you. Okay? And so that's why I, I plead, come on board. Hop into the adventure. I've, I've been blessed to talk about Jesus a lot this week. Uh, <laughs> I said to someone just uh, recently, I said, following Jesus is like this invitation to be wrong. <laughs> and do you know what I mean by that? Like, we don't like being wrong. I don't. Uh, we don't oftentimes like being challenged. We don't like being... Um, led to think that maybe we don't have it all together or that we've, we're not pursuing things that are the best. And here's this Jesus, and he's saying, hey, like, I love you, but there's a way to live differently. There's a way to live better. If you're here today and you refuse to live different, if you think you got all this figured out, if you, if you just think you've got everything about God nailed down, well, guess what? This probably ain't going to be a lot of fun. But if you're here and you're open to being wrong, to being changed, to being different, to being better, to live with God's purpose for your life as your motivation every day, then welcome to the adventure. (laughs) That was last week. The promise of the Creator is that by His power we change the world. That's what Acts is all about. The power of God changing the world through followers of Jesus. And that you get to enjoy that life now, but you get to hope in the promise of an abundant joy that is forever later, okay? And Acts, we've quoted this a few times. This has been important to my life growing up. You're going to read Acts, and you're going to wonder like me, well, is it just for them? Is it for me too? Just for them, for me too? Look, I love what Peter said in Acts 2. He said, this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. So guess what? This promise is for me too, brother for me too and for you I'm excited um, and I want you to be a part of it okay so if you're stuck on lesser things that weaken you and stress you and steal your joy and and constantly make you upset about things then welcome to the way of Jesus the joy of God Jesus said God did not send his son into the world to judge the world but that the world through him might be saved and then later in John he said it's the thief actually that comes to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus said, I came so that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. And so this is kind of like my explanation of Acts part two, okay? Part two, the explanation of Acts. Acts in a nutshell, if you will. Acts describes this adventurous life of the Jesus followers. It's not boring. It's not boring at all. (laughs) It's an adventurous life of Jesus followers. It's a life that's inspired by the power, I'm sorry, the promise. Let me get this right. It's a life that is inspired by the promise of abundance. Life may not feel that all abundant right now, but guess what? Our promise is abundance. It's a life that is inspired now by the promise of an abundance, and it's empowered now by the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's Acts. Isn't that cool? I think that's cool. I think that's really cool. And so Acts details this adventurous life. All right, check this out with me. Uh, You you will... um, This might sound different in some ways, and and maybe I hope it does, and it should. Uh, Acts begins, the first chapter of Acts begins, I will suggest, with uh, with an example of the Jesus followers being disciplined in their obedience. And this is important. Some of you say, I want this empowerment. I want this adventure. I want this life. Well, Bible tells us that it starts with disciplined obedience. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. Disciplined obedience is the first principle lesson of Acts. It's, uh, I was using the word principle a lot this week, so I looked up some synonyms for it. I don't know why principle. Main, chief, primary, crucial, key, foremost, dominant, essential, right? 
Uh, disciplined obedience is the main, chief, primary, crucial, key, principal lesson of Acts chapter 1. A disciplined obedience. An obedience that was not easy, but a, an obedience that was disciplined. I want you to see that with me, okay, as we prepare for this empowerment of the Spirit, this life that, that is lived in adventure, okay, I would suggest that Acts details for us that it starts with disciplined obedience. And how are we in that? How are we in our disciplined obedience to the commands of Jesus? Some of you hear that, and, 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 and you got all kinds of things that you think. Disciplined obedience to commands. you probably got some of those pet commands that you like to pull out of Scripture here and there. I'm not being critical to you. I just know how we are. I suggested last week that we follow the commands of Jesus where? where where's the first and... Where's a really, really good place? Can I say it that way? Where's a really, 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 really good place to go to consume the commands of Jesus? Where? Remember last week? Where's a really good place to go to consume the commands of Jesus? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. His Sermon on the Mount. So, so do we want this empowerment of the Spirit like we see in Acts? I will suggest to you that we give careful, careful, diligent attention to the commands of Jesus that we read about in His Sermon on the Mount. How are we doing with that? We said last week, okay? I want you to see how these disciples did it. Re uh, recall in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 8, they were listening to their teacher. He commanded them. This is not on the screen. If you have your Bibles open, 4 and 8. It says, He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father. Wait for what the Father had prom uh, promised. What did the Father promise? The Father had promised this Holy Spirit immersion. Jesus says, I command you to stay in Jerusalem and wait for that. And then he says in verse 8, You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in all the earth. That's what Jesus had told them. There's all kinds of things that, comes to, my, that come to my mind in that text. Um, the first thing is, really the first thing is immersion of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Man, I want to talk about that, but I'm not. This is where I'm going to do things different. I'm not. Because I don't think that's the principal teaching of this chapter. It's really cool to talk about the immersion or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A lot of churches and Christians divide over what they think that means and how that applies. Stay in the text with me. What's going on here? Jesus told them to stay in Jerusalem and you wait for what the Father has promised. Okay? And when that happens, you're going to be my witnesses to Jerusalem and to all the world. That's what Jesus had told them. And so what do they do? They do that. Do you think they did that with full certainty as to whatever the promise of the Holy Spirit was? Do you think they did that with an understanding of what in the world was going to happen to them later? I don't think so. They were probably pretty curious, maybe a little confused, but what did they do? They waited, church. They waited. They went back to Jerusalem and they waited. Okay, They went to the place where they had just seen their, their master crucified. They went back there. That had to be a little crazy. Uh, read verses uh, 12 again through 14 of chapter 1. So they went back. They returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. They, they weren't very far. They went back. And they entered the city and they went to the upper room. That's cool. I won't say a lot about that, but that's probably the same upper room that they had the Lord's Last Supper in. Th this was a familiar place to them. They went back. There they were staying, that is, and then a listing of the 12 names, or the 11 names, rather, minus Judas. Judas is not a part of their fellowship anymore. And then it says, these all with one mind were, what? Continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Again, they went back to the place where five or six weeks earlier Jesus had been rejected and crucified. They went back to what was probably the same room uh, where they had met and discussed what was going to happen with Jesus. And what did they do? They waited there. And while they were waiting, these all with one, with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with women. That's something 
that intrigues me, but again, not the principal message of this text that we're going to try to stick to. Okay, I mentioned to a friend this week, and maybe this will help you too. Remember, I told you I got to say a few things about Jesus this week, and it was great. I was telling a friend this week that I think one of the primary things that we're to do as Christians right now is to wait well. Write that down if you need to. One of your primary responsibilities as a Christian right now is to wait well. How, how are you doing at waiting? You know, we're waiting too. These men and disciples, they were waiting for this promise of the Father, this, this immersion of the Holy Spirit. And I'll try to indicate to you today that they waited really well. How are we waiting? How are we waiting? Are we waiting well? Again, one of the primary to-dos of the Christian is to wait well. We have an already but not yet faith. I like talking about that. That may go over your head, and I don't mean for it to. But so much about our faith is that we get to be a part of Jesus' kingdom right now. Amen. Hallelujah. I am saved. Isn't that great? But there's also this element of our faith that is waiting. Already, not yet. Some of you may hear that. I love that phrase, okay? So we're too waiting for a promise. And hey, guess what? Confession. It's not easy. I won't pretend like it is. It's hard. People hurt us. People rip our heart out. We grow weary. We lose heart. We're not disciplined. I confess, like, man, broke me down this week to realize times when I was disciplined. And then where did that go? I know where it went. It went with all my negativity that was swirling around through the past three years. So we're undisciplined and we're not faithful. And look at this first example of these, of these wonderful followers of Jesus in the book that I have claimed so often to pattern. What are they doing? They're waiting well. And how are they doing it? By continual devotion to prayer. That's what they're doing. A body of believers devoted to prayer. A body of believers devoted to prayer. I'm going to ask us this a lot through Acts, probably because I've heard a lot of Acts preached as though we do it. And so I'd like to ask us often through this study, how are we doing at this? How are we doing at waiting well? How are we doing at being continually devoted to prayer? I'm convinced I'm talking to some of you who are prayer warriors. I thank you. I know you pray for me. I know you pray for my family. But I'm not often convinced that our churches are characterized by devotion to prayer. I'm not often convinced by that. I want a revolution. You guys know this about me. I'm not okay with status quo. I'm not okay with maintenance. I often look back at times that I think were great, but I wonder, did they look like Jesus? I want a revolution. I want to be people that follow this guy and get called crazy for it. And maybe, just maybe, something that prepares us for that is devotion to prayer. Continual devotion to prayer. Look at the text with me. I've been inspired by some stories lately. Um, I was inspired to read of a story of a man who's made it his mission to plant churches in America. But he doesn't do it the way you might think. His churches don't often look like big, fancy buildings. So I read through his book, and I'm inspired by some of his writing. And this week I read how he detailed where a one-hour prayer session spontaneously turned into 13 hours of prayer. Wow. You know what I think? Did they get to eat? Did it keep them up all night? I've been inspired by a, a church leader not too far from us who wrote a book about modern day church restoration. You know, such movements exist, modern church restoration movements, not just movements that think it was won and done back in the 19th century. I like his reading. He gave a list for steps to a revolution, and I think it's like step six that says, make your gatherings, make your location a house of prayer. Let, let this assembly be characterized by how you pray. I've often been inspired by, by what I've seen here. 
That's why I'm so confident in, in, in here. Even when people would criticize it, I'm still confident. I've been inspired by times where we've gathered here and prayed without time limits. For two and three hours, we've prayed. I've been inspired by some visitors, I hate to call them visitors, but some friends who are back today who insisted that some of our traditional meetings and retreats be characterized by prayer, even if it's at night and in craft buildings all through the night. Thank you. I've been inspired by older believers who maybe they've done it privately because they are scared, I don't know, brothers and sisters, men and women, just like in Acts, who have came to my office and said, I'm praying with you. Oh, really? When? Right now. Let's do it. Thank you, sister. I'm thankful for that. Fellowships that are categorized by fervent and continual and consistent prayer. All been a part of this fellowship. It makes me excited. I think about how we've argued over so many things. So many things we've let characterize our fellowships. So many things that we've plucked and pulled out of Acts even when maybe we've missed the principal lessons what characterized the first followers of Jesus in Acts? It's right there, plain as day. Prayer. 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 Fervent prayer. It's no wonder that we read about what we read about in Acts. It's no wonder we read this marvelous adventure of the early Jesus followers. These were times where people were devoted to prayer. They were waiting in prayer. And so, after days of devotion to prayer, Peter stood up and this is what he said. Follow it with me. He said, brethren, the Scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. He was counted among us and he received his share in this ministry. Then verse 20, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate and let no one dwell in it. Let another man take his office. Let me teach you something for just a minute, or you might just go, boop, that didn't sound familiar. <clears throat> the, 12, is this, the 12 apostles were important. I've said this a few times. They had a specific job, okay? Jesus called 12 men to reflect the promise that Israel would have a king. Israel called 12 men to resemble the 12 tribes of Israel. You see, Israel had spent their lifetime rejecting prophets, Israel had spent their lifetime kicking out ministers of God. Israel had disobeyed and rebelled against God over and over and over again. It was their history. These 12 men were called to reflect that nation and to show to them this promise that God has not forsaken you. In fact, God is redeeming you. Israel, you have a king. His name is Jesus. That's what these 12 men were called to do. Jesus said it in Luke 22. Write that down. Go look at it if you want. You remember the language. They're arguing over who's the greatest. Jesus says, guys, 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 you've been with me through all of my trials. Know this, you're all great. You will be the twelve who judge the tribes of Israel. You remember how Jesus said that? Indicating that they had a very important role in this ministry. The redemption of Israel. Oh, it's so cool. But what happened to one of them? One of them went away. One of them consumed in his greed, turned over Jesus, betrayed Jesus. Do you know his name? You may be here for the first time, never heard Christianity in your life, but you probably know that Judas was a traitor, right? That was Judas. And so it was important, it was very important for Judas to be replaced. He'd failed and he needed to be replaced. And this is what we see in Acts, okay? And so... After fervent prayer, fervent prayer, fervent prayer, what does Peter do? He's finally ready to stand up boldly. I wish I knew what that looked like, you know? Oh, I get it. Or, oh, Peter stood up in their midst and he said, this is, what I'm, this is what I'm understanding. The Holy Spirit spoke through the mouth of David concerning Judas. Everything about Judas had been prophesied by David. And maybe he recalled Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. And he's, he says, For it is written in the book of the Psalms, Let his homestead be desolate, no one dwell in it, no one dwell in it, and let another man take his place. That's what's going on here. One of the things I notice first is that after fervent prayer, what, what, what does Peter stand on? After fervent prayer, where does he get his answer? This is cool. After fervent prayer, where does he get his answer? From Scripture. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? I think God answers prayers in all kinds of ways. 
I'll scare you to death if I tell you everything I think, so I won't. But I think that his primary way of answering our prayers is through this, through this scripture, this inspired word of God. And isn't it awesome? Isn't it awesome how they spend all this time in fervent prayer and then boom, Peter says, well, look here, it's been here my whole life. You know how many times I've said that? That text has been here my whole life. I just wasn't ready for it. I was blind to it. Boy, it came alive after Peter spent time in prayer. I love that. <clears throat> Following prayer, Peter believed and proclaimed that Psalm 69 and Psalm 109 prophetically applied to Judas and that these psalms gave instructions for what they must do. And now these words of God were speaking to him, right? He had pleaded with God and now God was speaking back. I'm not sure if I would have interpreted these psalms this way, but I'm so thankful that Peter did after fervent prayer, okay? And so I want you to see this. Again, principal lessons from Acts chapter 1. Principal lesson. A very important decision was made and Scripture was acted upon only when? After days of waiting well in continual devotion to prayer. That's pretty wordy, wasn't it? That's why I put it on the screen. Okay? Big decision. Big decision. God's plan for redeeming Israel. These 12 tribes... Big decision was made only after what? Days in fervent, gathered prayer. Do we look like that? Does that categorize us? Boy, we've used Scripture to call ourselves sound in so many ways. But do we look like this? Or have we been distracted by other things? Have we, have we let other things keep us from the principal messages? What's Acts 1 all about? They were obeying Jesus and they were praying fervently. Have we been distracted by other things? Let me spend a little bit of time on something that's been a distraction for me. And I hope I do this well. Lord, help me do this well. If you were following Garrett then you might have read 18 through 19 and, and been a little distracted. 18 through 19. This is, this is like a, a note that we think Luke put into the text. Okay? 18, 19 says, Now this man, referring to Judas, this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his intestines gushed out. I don't get opportunity often to emphasize gushing intestines from the pulpit so well I'm going to capitalize on this and it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem so that in their own language that field was called Hakodama however Garrett said it that is the field of blood I was going over this uh, Wednesday night in the teen class and one of our young people said wait a minute I thought Judas hung himself and I thought, man, that's cool. You know some Bible, you know? Because why? Matthew 27 says Judas hung himself. And so if you're like me, boy, that distracts me quick. Because I'm thinking, okay, i got to reconcile this. i got to fit this together. And then, if you need to reconcile that, I'll help you. We can talk about it. We can hang out. Any, any opportunity for coffee, right? If... If reconciling things like that is important to you, then we can talk. You may not like what I tell you, but we can talk, all right? Um, but I'm also going to warn you. Some of you will hear this. Some of you don't. Some of you won't need to, and that's fine. But I'll also warn you that relying on everything making sense to you is a poor foundation to build your faith on. Sometimes I think I was kind of raised not to blame anybody. I, I loved it for a while. For a while, my faith, if I could even call it that, spent time loving trying to make everything make sense. I will tell you, that is a bad foundation to build your faith on, all this making sense. And what I'll suggest to you is that sometime spending hours and hours and hours in trying to make the Bible make sense, can become a proud idol. 
And if we spend hours and write books and cut our teeth on trying to make things make sense, guess what we might miss? Principal messages. Amen. That's what we might miss. And you know what principal messages do? Obeying them, they start revolutions. That's what they do. You want a principal message? Something gruesome and terrible happened to the one who turned his back on Jesus. There's the principal message for you. You read into this and you try to study what, what, what was the legacy of Judas. What was the share of Judas? As Peter said, the share of the betrayer was a desolated home. A lineage that was decimated. The share of Judas was a legacy of blood and death. That was the share of Judas. The share of Judas was a wasted vocation. A purpose that had to be fulfilled by another. That was the share of Judas. Guess what? Some of you need to hear this. I've heard a lot of great lessons about Judas. A lot of great ones. They exist. Go find them. My favorite lessons about Judas are the ones that are of the grace of God and the love of Jesus. How even Judas ate at the table with, Judah, with Jesus. How even Judas had his feet washed by Jesus. The Old Testament details the love of God who even pastures sheep that are doomed for slaughter. I've heard some great lessons about Judas. But I do not want to end up like Judas. I don't want to end up like Judas. I don't want to be one who in my selfishness ignores the Jesus that is right in front of me. The twelve apostles, again, they were the ones. They had a job. And it was going to be fulfilled. Peter knew that. Jesus had told them that. The prayers and the Scripture reinforced it and emboldened Peter to stand up and to fulfill the mission of proclaiming the resurrected King of Israel. And that's what they did. That's what they did, right? Where am I at? I don't know. You guys know. I'm going to throw this thing. <clears throat> that's what he did. Therefore... It is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time, that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us. There's an ascension reference. I love that. One of these must become witness with us of his resurrection. It's time for Judas to be replaced. Let me, let me, uh, let me share my conviction with you for just a minute. I wonder... How much of God's incredible plan for me is waiting to be fulfilled because I've not listened to what He's telling me to do. I wonder how much of God's incredible plan for old union is waiting to be fulfilled because we have not listened and we are not ready. I love reading this text and getting so excited about how they had listened to Jesus. They had obeyed Him fervently and now they were ready. They were ready for this incredible mission to proclaim the King of the world. And again, what preceded this readiness? What is arguably the greatest moment in all of the Bible story? I, creation. Boom. Maybe I, I could pro I'd probably say that when I preach creation. His return. I'd probably say that when I preach return. But right now I'm preaching Acts. And so I can't think of nothing better than heaven and earth being united in sinful man being saved and being part of the kingdom. It's, it's all coming together here in Acts. Isn't that awesome? And, and, and what led to it? What led to it? What was it preceded by? This disciplined obedience to Jesus, even if it, if it was weird and uncomfortable and involved waiting. What led to it? Gatherings that were devoted to prayer. I, I, sit me down and let's let this be prayer. Like, that's okay. Let, let this community know that old union prays. He preaches a bit, fine, a bit, but man, they pray. How cool would that be? What preceded this? Bold proclamations of God's Word. And not in self-righteousness. We get it wrong when it's self-righteousness. 
Not in proud, pharisaical rightness. Well, we finally got what Acts says, so we're going to do it. No. But in the strength of God and for God's glory. That's what they did. This is so cool. This disciplined obedience, continual devotion, and bold proclamation. So look at what they did. This is where we wrap up. So they put forward two men. It's time to move, boys. Let's do it. They put forward two men. Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice, and Matthias. <laughs> I got to laugh at the Bible sometimes. Joseph must have a little reputation, right? And Matthias. And what'd they do? Go figure. What'd they do? They prayed. And this is how they prayed. I want you to look at this. You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men. You know what that sounds like to me? God, you're greater than all. Isn't that cool? Maybe these disciples really were paying attention to the commands of Jesus. I, I see Jesus' model prayer here. Do you see it? I've been convicted this week to start my prayers with praise. I appreciate prayers from this mic that start with, Father, hallowed be your name. God, you are the one who knows the hearts. You, it's you, you know. And so do what? Help us now. Help us. Help us bring heaven to earth. You see that here? Help us bring your way here, right? Help us choose who is to accompany this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside and went his own way. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell on the short name, Matthias. And he was added to the eleven apostles. Do you know what I'm inspired by? Can I share with you what I'm inspired by? What I'm inspired by more than baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's interesting. And, and I'm excited to talk about that. But you know what I'm inspired by more? You know what I'm inspired by more than even the women alongside praying, which we should talk about. And that's interesting. You know what I'm inspired by more than, than arguing over how to reconcile Judas' death? That's interesting. And I, and I want to talk about that. You know what I'm inspired by more than whatever they were doing casting lots? That's interesting. And I want to talk about that, but I can't let any of those things distract me from what? The principal and primary message of what's going on here. So you know what inspires me more? Disciples, men and women, who in this text were doing what? Crazy devoted to prayer. Uh, continually devoted to prayer, listening to God, and then making decisions all for His glory, calling upon His name. That's what inspires me. How, how about it here? There's that question again. How about it here? We really want to be the Acts church? How about it here? Open the floodgates. Let's let them pour in, right? Come on, guys. <clears throat> we shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne. With humble hearts into His presence, we bring an offering of song. Glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. We shall assemble in His memory to come and gather at His feet. His love compels us to His table. With one another we shall eat. Glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the Redeemed. 
and at the end of our journey, we shall bow down on bended knee, and with the angels up in heaven, we'll sing the song of victory, glory and honor and dominion, unto the Lamb, unto the King, oh hallelujah, hallelujah, we sing the Amen. Singing the song of the redeemed. So I'm convicted. I'm responding. But I don't need anybody to come up here with me, brother. I'll never forget that. Let my response be something that you might could join in too, though. I'm confessing that for much of my life I have said that acts justifies my, Christ, my Christianity. For so much of my life, I have said Acts justifies my Christianity. For so much of my life, I have thought, you want to see my church? Go look at Acts. And guess what? I am more and more convinced that I have not followed it well. And I have not taken principle lessons serious. And that I've been distracted by things that I've wanted to argue. I sent a message to somebody this week. I said, I'm going to stop teaching so much my doctrinal intrigue and start teaching what I think we all need to hear. And it's these principal lessons of the Jesus people, the Jesus movement, that we so well see here in Acts. And so if such is you, then I invite you to join in not being okay with where we are. I invite you to join in taking action in in helping in letting God's Spirit, if you will, make this church of Christ really model Jesus' church. I invite you to do that. And I think it looks like relying on God's Spirit to lead us An example that we see first laid out right here. And it involves us, as we have in our bulletin, it involves us having a new life in a union that is age old and glorious and eternal. How about that? The invitation is yours. Let's stand and sing.